hello to our Bethel family watching and participating in this worship service all over the world. We welcome you. And to those of you who are not members of Bethel, but you're joining us today and maybe have been joining us on a weekly basis, we trust that the Word of God and the worship that emanates from this place is being a tremendous blessing to you and your family. Today, we're about to enter into a time of glorious worship again of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which will be followed by a very practical and very, very important message from the Word of God that you cannot afford to miss. In fact, I would recommend that you share this video now so that many of your family and friends can participate. And if you have time, go ahead and call one or two or however, or whatever you need to do so that they get you here. We're gonna be talking about how to be ready, how to make sure we're ready and how to be ready for the second coming. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. Let's enter our service now and begin to worship Jesus who deserves all our praise. Hallelujah. Father God, we welcome you in this place. We honor you. We reverence you. We exalt you in this place. You are awesome, oh God. You are marvelous. You are good. We worship you. We exalt you. We extol you. There is none like you, Jesus. your hands galaxy spinning the heavenly dance oh god all that you are is so overwhelming and i hear the sound of your voice all at once is so gentle and tender. Captivated by your beauty Cause I'm overwhelmed 
worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. worship you, Lord of Lords. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you in this place. You are awesome, oh God. Yes, you, are. you are awesome, oh God. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, oh God. Who is like unto you, oh God? Thank you, Jesus. Rose of Sharon, we worship you. Sarah's of 10,000. We worship you.
the sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before
Repasa nararabo koshi kaya masandara rabo sha. Eka nara la 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 bosha nara la 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 bosha. Uska la 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 bosha nara la 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 bosha.
wonderful counselor who you are. The bomb in Gilead is who you are. A resting place. We do give you praise. And now we're about to receive our communion. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which was broken for you. We know that his body was broken so that ours can be made whole. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace fell upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. And therefore, we can claim healing today on the basis of his finished work. 39 stripes on his back left his back completely bruised and whipped and bleeding and every lash represented sickness and disease that he was taken into himself absorbing our sicknesses into his body so that we can be made whole Today, as we partake, I'm inviting you now to claim, yes, physical healing for yourself. Physical healing for those you're praying for. Let's believe now, as we partake, that by the stripes of Jesus, we're healed. That gives me strength from day. worship it's the blood that Jesus shed for me way back come down the blood that gives me strength from the Today, because of our faith in the blood, faith in the blood for the forgiveness of our sins, faith in the blood for deliverance from every curse, faith in the blood for divine and supernatural protection, faith in the blood for full and total supply. Together, we partake now by faith in the blood of Jesus. Let us partake. All right, where you are, let's worship. Yes, Lord.
Amen. He will never, never lose his power. We continue to quarantine ourselves under the blood and to claim supernatural protection and healing from our bodies on the basis of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now we get to worship him. He who gave his life is all for us. We get to respond to such love by loving him back. And so with our tithes and with our offerings, we worship him and we express how much we love him. With our tithes and our offerings, we worship him and we express how grateful we are to him for who he is and for what he has done for us. And with our tithes and our offerings, we worship him and we demonstrate our faith that he is able to take care of us and our hope and our trust is in him and not in ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. And when we worship in faith and when we express gratitude and when we express our love in such a tangible manner to him, he is glorified. Yes. He is blessed. And he in turn blesses us even more. Amen. So let's worship now. Amen. With our tithes and our offerings, please follow the instructions on the screen. Use the various means by which you can advance God's kingdom and participate in what God is doing here through your giving. God bless you. I thank God for his faithfulness. He continues to be good to all of us. Uh, can never stop praising him for his love and for his kindness and grace that we enjoy every day. Uh, I just want you to know, Bethel, that the church, is a, the church is open for business like never before. Uh, we are reaching out into our community. We're serving the Lord. Uh, in so many different ways, we have a, 
uh, every Saturday here at the church, God has blessed us to be able to provide uh, free food to the people in our community who are coming between 9 and 1030. Literally every Saturday for the last four weeks, we've been serving over 100 people. Uh, and they are being helped, and in that way, we're being the light, and we're making a difference. I want to thank those of you who have given consistently. You have been faithful with your tithes and your offerings, and you are making this possible. And then those of you who have given even extra, which you have designated for benevolence to help us do this. And we're going to continue to do it as long as we see there's a need, and as long as the Lord enables us to, and you continue to give. I want to also thank God because uh, in so many ways, this pandemic, with all of its uh, evil uh, and all of the harm that it has brought to so many, there's still light shining in the midst of the darkness. And we continue to trust God that this is coming to an end soon, allowing us to begin to go about our business normally and certainly allowing us to be able to gather again as a family to worship God together. I love the opportunity I have to speak to you via uh, social media. We thank God for this tool, but it's not a substitute for seeing you face to face, seeing your smile, holding your hands, laughing. And may the Lord hasten the time soon when we can regather in that manner. Now let's go to the word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to minister your word again this morning to your people. We know the Holy Spirit is present to give us utterance. We know his presence to give your people understanding. Our faith and our confidence is in him and in him alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I'm going to be speaking to you this morning from the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1 to verse uh, 13, and uh, I want to talk to you about how to be ready for the second coming, how to be ready for the second coming. You know, there are a lot of occasions that you may have want to uh, be a part of, and you miss those occasions for one reason or another. You were disappointed, but they were not eternal consequences. You were able to get up and move on, and there were other occasions that you could attend and participate in the future, but it's not so with the second coming. You cannot afford not to be ready when Jesus returns. What did I say? You cannot afford not to be ready when Jesus returns. And unfortunately, many of you who are watching today may in fact not be ready. I fear that if Jesus was to come today, there are many of you who are watching who would not be ready, who would be left behind. What a tragedy. And this is something that God does not want. He doesn't want one of you, let me repeat, he does not want one of you who is watching to be left behind. Yet, when you look at the parable we're about to read, Jesus talked about ten virgins. And he said, five of them were ready, and five of them were not. Now, uh, we cannot use that and, and draw a conclusion that 50% of the people will not be ready, but it certainly suggests that there is a large number of people who will not be ready when Jesus comes. Who are those people who will be ready? Who are those who will not be ready, and why? And what can you do? to make sure that you are ready when Christ returns. Let's read the parable. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 1, we read, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Let me just say this, first of all, this is a parable. And you, 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 you need to understand that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus used parables a lot to teach. Now, in a parable, there may be very, uh, there may be different elements in a parable. But a parable is told to make one main point. So you have to be very careful when you are interpreting parables so you don't treat them as allegories. An allegory is a story where 
just about everything has some spiritual meaning. Not so with the parables. The parables of a story is embellished. There are many details in the story that are, not in, that are not intended to mean anything other than to facilitate the story that is being told and to facilitate the main point that the speaker wants to make. And so we need to know clearly what the main point is. There will be some symbols in this parable, and those symbols can be safely interpreted because they represent things that I use elsewhere in Scripture consistently so we can look at the Bible and how the Bible has used some of these symbols in this parable and be on solid ground when we use those same meanings to help us understand this particular parable a little bit better. So we read that there were ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom? Again, Jesus referred himself in Matthew chapter 9 as the bridegroom. We know that the church is the bride of Christ. So we can safely say and have biblical basis for doing so. This is not something that we're just pulling out of the air. That the bridegroom in this story, in this parable, is Jesus, represents Jesus. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, the oil also is a symbol, and we'll discuss that later. But the oil is a symbol. It represents something else, something spiritual. Uh, but the wise took oil in their vessels. They took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Notice the foolish took no oil with them in their vessels. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And the Bible says, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all these virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil. For our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for you and me, but go rather to, the, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Listen. Let me just make a comment right now. Clearly what Jesus wants to communicate here is that there's just some things that are not transferable. There's some things that you receive from God that you can share with others. But there's some things that we receive from God that we cannot transfer. Everybody has to receive those things directly from the only one who can give them, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the wedding, and the door was shut. Now, that's tragic. While they went to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and the door was shut. Afterward, they also came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, as surely I say to you, I do not know you. And then we find the last sentence in the parable, which really tells us the meaning, the purpose, the point that Jesus was going to make. And this is the point that we need to lay a hold of and we need to act upon. This is what Jesus says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Watch therefore. So the entire parable was told to provide us with a warning. And here is the warning. Christ Jesus will return. And when he returns, if you are not ready you will be left behind. Therefore, whatever it takes to be ready, be ready. That's the point of this parable. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he'll receive all those who are ready. But those who are not ready will be left behind. Therefore, be ready. Now, let's begin to look at this more closely. 
Obviously, again, the bridegroom represents Jesus. The, 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 the wedding feast represents that, that, that marriage supper of the Lamb. And it, 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 all of these things uh, refer to the end times and to the second coming of Christ. The ten virgins, who are they? The majority of Bible scholars and expositors agree that the ten virgins in this passage, in this parable, represent the, the, the visible church that will be present on earth when Christ returns. The visible church that will be present on earth during the last days when Christ returns. Now, this is my position as well. I believe that these ten virgins represent the visible church as it will be when Christ returns. Now, you will see that in the visible church, there will be two groups of people that are part of the church, two groups of people that identify themselves as, as Christians, two groups of people that attend church on a regular basis, that participate in church services, that serve in churches, that lead churches that hold important positions in churches. Two groups of people will be found in the visible church. One group will be ready when the Lord returns. Another group will not be. One group will be those who merely profess Christ but they do not possess Christ. The other group will consist of those who not only profess Christ, but they possess Christ. And so you have professors, and all who are in the church will profess Christ, but then you have a smaller group among the professors who are possessors of Christ. Amen? They are not just make believers. You have the professors and the possessors. You have the true believer and you have the make believer. There are a lot of folks who are in church and who identify themselves as Christians who are make believers. Now, let's look more closely at the details because, again, we want to make sure that we who call ourselves Christians, that we are ready when the Lord returns, we want to make sure that we're not just professors, but we are possessors of Christ. We're not just make believers, we are truly believers in Christ Jesus. Now, if you observe, there were a lot of things that the um, wise and foolish versions all had in common. They all were invited, they all had lamps, they all took their lamps to meet the bridegroom, they all slept when the bridegroom tarried, and when the midnight cry was heard, all ten of them got up to trim their lamps. So if you were looking at them outwardly, you would not be able to tell the difference. They looked the same, and to a large degree, they acted and did the same things. Jesus saw another parable somewhere else where he talked about the wheat and the tares. And, 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 and you notice in that parable as well, Jesus said to those who wanted to remove the wheat, he says, you know what, leave them, let them grow together. Because if you try to remove the tares now, you end up maybe destroying some of the wheat. And Jesus was indicating that it's hard to tell the difference between the wheat and the tear when they're all together like that outwardly. So give it time until he himself can provide the separation. So again, we see in this parable, there's so much that the wise versions and the foolish versions have in common. So outwardly, to a large degree, you would think that all of them are ready to meet the Lord. They all seem like they're Christians. They have the same language. They, they carry Bibles. They 
They believe in God. They believe in heaven. They believe Jesus is coming again. And, and so outwardly, they look alike. They sound alike. But they're not exactly alike. Fundamentally, while outwardly you might not be able to distinguish them, they are different inwardly. Jesus said, because of that difference, which we'll look at shortly, one group is foolish and one group is wise. Now, the word wise there uh, means that there's one group that is thoughtful, sensible, insightful, deliberate, have, have foresight, and so they're making a wise or they're making wise decisions relative to their relationship to, 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 to God. There's another group called the foolish ones, and that word that is translated foolish is the word that we get, we used to get the word moron. So literally Jesus is saying, here's one group that's wise, but here's another group among those who profess to be Christians who are foolish or who are morons. Now that's, that's very strong, but Jesus literally is saying, there's a group among those who call themselves Christians who are morons. And uh, what did they do to, to deserve to be called morons? Well, the difference is this. The wise took oil with them in their vessels. The morons did not take any oil in their vessels. Now, what, what is so moronic about this is because anybody knows that if you're going to take a lamp, and by the way, the lamp there is not the, it's a torch. The, the more accurate translation there is a torch. And if you know, it's just torches that have the, the sticks. And then on the top of the torch, you have this wire mesh with some combustible wick or cloth in it. And they would put oil or fuel on the cloth, and then that would be lit, and that would provide the light. So every, any person with any common sense view that if you're going to need light and you need the torch to continually burn and not go out, you would have to have a source of oil. You would have to have fuel to keep the fire from going out. So it was the custom when you were taking the torch, and especially if you didn't know how long you would need it, you would always take some oil in a vessel that would be used to continually feed the fire so that the fire doesn't go out. The light never goes out. And so Jesus is saying, for people who know that they need to keep the fire burning, they need to keep the light on, who are going to be participating in such an important event as a wedding, they're part of the bridal party, they understand that the light must be burning when the groom comes for them to participate in the procession, for them to have failed to put oil in their vessel to ensure their light never goes out. He says that was as absolutely moronic. So we got to pay very special attention to this fact that they took no oil in their vessels because, you see, it is that that separates the wise from the foolish. The presence of oil in their vessels versus the absence of oil in their vessel. Those who will be ready for the Lord have oil in their vessels. Those who will not be ready for the Lord have no oil in their vessels. So now the question we must answer is, what does the oil represent? Because my eternal destiny, my readiness to meet Christ depends upon me having oil in my vessels. Not oil with me just around, but oil in my vessel. Well, this is one of those symbols that we really can be 
almost 100%, in fact, 100% sure that we're translating or we're interpreting it right. When we say that the oil here is a clear indication of the Holy Spirit. The oil that Jesus talks about that is in the vessel represents the Holy Spirit. And it is the presence of the Holy Spirit within a man that makes that person ready for the return of Christ. It is the absence of the Holy Spirit within a person that will disqualify that person and cause that person, even though he or she is part of the visible church, to be left behind. Now, let's comment further. What does this mean? It means that there are many who are part of the church. And when I say the church, I'm including Bethel. But not just Bethel, I'm referring to the church all around the world, the visible church. There are many professing Christians who do not have within their vessel the Holy Spirit. They have all the external things that, quote unquote, go with Christianity in our day and our time. But that which is essential to make a man ready to go when the Lord comes, the Holy Spirit in his vessel is absent. Just because you say hallelujah doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. Just because you sing in a choir doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. Now, this doesn't mean you have no experiences with the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit acting upon you and the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. So even those in our midst who will not make it can indeed testify from time to time they felt the Spirit or the Spirit of God can slain them and they fall on the ground or they can get a prophetic word and, 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 and sometimes feel good. Listen. The Holy Spirit can act upon us. In fact, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So there is an activity of the Holy Spirit that influences, impacts, and affects all people, including sinners and unregenerate people. But so just because you are having certain experiences with the Holy Spirit does not mean, hear me, doesn't mean he lives on the inside of you. Doesn't mean he's dwelling in your vessel. Is you made your very well mean he's trying to, to move you to make the commitment that you need to make, to make the decisions you need to make that will allow him then to take residence in you and prepare you for Christ's return. Very important. So, now that I believe I've established, I hope enough for you to accept it, that within our churches, including Bethel, unfortunately, there may be in fact, many people, I'm not saying just a few, because Jesus said, you know, five of the virgins were foolish. And that's, out of ten, if five are foolish, that's a lot. So there may be many, you know, in the church of about a thousand people, there may be hundreds who call themselves Christians in our church and who do not have the oil of the Holy Spirit on the inside of them. So then... What are we going to do? Listen to the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. You can have all the other things that quote unquote go with Christianity, a Bible. Church involvement, even good works that you are able to do in the name of, of Christ. If the Holy Spirit is not living inside of you, the Bible says you are not his. Remember Jesus talked about those who would say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? Didn't we work miracles in your name? And he said, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. And so here again, you can have all of these outward things and still not have 
the Holy Spirit dwelling in your vessel. It's critical. And only those who have oil in the lamb will be prepared to go when the Lord comes. So here's the question then. When does the Holy Spirit come into a man? I've just said you can have experiences with the Holy Spirit. You can even maybe feel him. He can touch you. He can heal you. He can do a lot of things for you. But when does he actually come into a man, thereby equipping and preparing that man for the Lord's return? This is when it happens. It happens at the moment you are born again. It happens at the moment you are born again. And you are born again when you genuinely repent of your sins and you surrender to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When does the Holy Spirit come into you? He comes into you when you are born again. So that's why Jesus said that Nicodemus, who was a very religious man, a very good man by earthly standards, a very moral man by earthly standards, Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Because with all of what he, Nicodemus was doing, are as religious as he was, a leader in the synagogue, unless you are born again, Jesus said, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with people who are in the kingdom. He says you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born again. So when does the oil come into the vessel? When does the Holy Spirit enter a man and prepares that man for the second coming? It is when you are born again. And you are born again when you repent of your sins and by faith you surrender. You surrender. By faith you surrender to Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. And here's the point. There are many who are among us who are not born again. There are many who are among us who have not genuinely repented of their sins. There are many who are among us who name the name of Christ, who have not surrendered by faith to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and consequently, they're not born again. You're hanging out with the virgins, but you're not ready. You're clothed in wedding garments outwardly, but like the foolish virgins, there's no oil in the lamp. There's no oil in your vessel. You're not ready. The Holy Spirit does not dwell in you, and the Holy Spirit does not dwell in you because you're not born again. And the reason you're not born again is because you have not yet repented of your sins. You have not yet truly surrendered your life to Christ as Lord and Savior. Ah, you, can, you call him Lord. You got the language. You talk a good talk. But you haven't repented of your sins. You haven't surrendered to Christ as your Lord and Savior. And until you do that, you don't experience the new birth. And the Holy Spirit does not come in to take residence inside of you. Now, there's some who, who, who look at this uh, parable and look at the ten virgins and they say, well, the five foolish virgins represent people who, who were Christians, but because of the way they lived or because they were not living right, therefore, you know, they were left behind, basically lost their salvation. Uh, I don't believe you can, you can make that point from this parable. These, are, these foolish versions are not people who were once Christians, once born again, and because of their works, they lost their salvation. No, these five foolish versions are people who call themselves Christians who were never born again. Why do I say that? I say that because, again, Jesus said they had no oil in their vessel. And the oil is the Holy Spirit. At the very beginning, they had no oil in their vessel. He didn't say they had oil in their vessel and then they lost the oil that was in their vessel. He said they had no oil. So these people had never been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which means they were never born again. And then at the end, Jesus says, I don't know you, which would mean, which would mean that 
He didn't know them then. He didn't know them before. They never had a personal relationship with Jesus. So these are not, quote, unquote, people who are born again, but because of their life, they lost their salvation. No, these are people who were among Christians, hanging out with Christians, friends of Christians, or behaving outwardly in a lot of ways like Christians, but who had never repented. I keep saying that because, hear me, if you are going to be ready, you've got to repent of your sins. And if you're going to be ready, you've got to truly, by faith, surrender to Christ as your Lord and Savior because only then do you experience the new birth and only then does the Holy Spirit who has been acting upon you now is legally permitted to come and dwell inside of you and cause you to be born again. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask you what may seem like a very elementary question, but in light of this parable, it's extremely important. And I'm going to ask it, and I really, really need every one of us who is watching and listening to answer this question and to answer it sincerely. I need to ask this question because this parable lets me know that there are many who may be among us who are not ready. And here's the question. Is the Holy Spirit living inside of you? Are you certain? Let me repeat. Is the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you? Are you certain? You see, you cannot afford to be uncertain about something that is so serious and that has eternal consequences. No man, no woman will be ready when Christ returns in whom the Holy Spirit does not dwell. And the Holy Spirit will dwell in no man who is not born again. And no man is born again who has not repented of sin and surrendered by faith to Christ as Lord and Savior. So, are you born again? Does the Holy Spirit dwell on the inside of you? Are you saved? Now, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me again repeat and reiterate because this is very important. Are you born again? Have you believed the gospel? Have you heard the gospel? Because this is how you get born again now. You hear the gospel and you believe it. Amen? Then you see your sinful self and you genuinely repent. And then you place your faith, you surrender by faith to Jesus Christ as Lord. You hear the gospel and you believe it. You see your sinful condition and you repent. And then by faith, you surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord. If you have done these things, then ladies and gentlemen, you are born again and the Spirit of Christ lives inside of you. If you have not done these things, do it now. Today is the accepted time. Jesus could return before the end of this sermon. So you don't even have to wait for me to get to the end. If you want to do it, you can do it right now. This is urgent. Christ could return before the end of this sermon. Will you be ready? Have you heard the gospel and believed it? Have you genuinely repented of your sins? Have you surrendered to Christ by faith as your Lord and Savior? Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Here's something else, though, again, because you cannot, you cannot afford to mess with this. So I'm going to put, push this even one step further. The Apostle Paul, in one of his epistles, he said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. 
Examine yourself. In other words, don't just take this for granted. Oh, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm safe. Uh uh, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. Don't take this for granted. Examine yourself to see whether you are indeed ready for Christ when he returns. Amen? Now, how do I examine myself? How can I be sure that I'm truly born again? There, 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 are, there are two things to look at. First of all, in examining yourself to see whether you're really born again and the Spirit of God really lives in you, look at what I call your inward experience with the Holy Spirit. Look at your inward experience. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you, there are things he begins to do on the inside of you that help to confirm his presence in your life. One of the things the Bible says he does is that he bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Is there a witness in your spirit? Is there a deep knowing on the inside of you that indeed my sins are forgiven, indeed I'm a child of God? He bears witness. So what inward experience, what inward witness do you have from the Spirit of God? Is he bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? You see, if you are truly a child of God and the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you will know it. You will know it because he will bear witness that he lives on the inside of you. There will be a knowing there. Do you have that knowing? Is it there? Now, along with that inward assurance that he is in, on the inside of you, there will also be an inward attitude that he will form on the inside of you that will cause you to be against sin. Let me repeat. Along with that inward assurance of his presence that your sins are forgiven, there will also be an inward attitude that he, the Holy Spirit, will form on the inside of you that will cause you to be against sin, to cause you not to want to live in sin, to cause you to want to overcome sin, to cause you to lack peace. Are you hearing me? Uh, to be disturbed by sin. Look for that. Is that happening on the inside of you? Because that would be a good indication that you indeed are a Christian. So a believer, a genuine believer will know it. But hear me, it's possible for one of those who are not born again to deceive himself or herself into thinking that he's born again when he's not. So besides the inward experience, I also invite you, because I believe it's biblical, to also examine, take a look at your outward expressions. Your outward expressions. If the Spirit of God is on the inside of you, the Bible says he will bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Your outward expressions, do you see on the outside of you, in the way you live, in the things you do, in the, 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 the priorities you set, do you see outwardly the expressions of the Holy Spirit as he's bearing fruit. You know, you know an apple tree is an apple tree because it bears apples. You know an orange tree is an orange tree because it bears oranges. And you would know that you are indwelled by the Spirit of God because you will begin to see the fruits of the Spirit. Now, you know, apple trees, you know, they make grow and you bear apples and not every year they produce the same amount and when they're young they may not produce as much as so there's growth in that but you will begin to experience and you will begin to see the manifestations of the fruit of the spirit love and joy and peace and these things that come from the Holy Spirit on the inside of you examine your outward expressions if the spirit of God is living on the inside of you hear me you will naturally practice and desire righteousness. You will practice righteousness without struggle. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to fall. But it means that this will be the quote-unquote natural flow of your life, will be towards righteousness, towards those things that are good, towards holiness. That's going to be the natural flow 
flow. That will be the bent of your life towards righteousness because that is your nature. Now, these are the outward expressions that prove that the nature of Christ is on the inside of you. On the other hand, if you examine your, your natural, your, your outward expressions and you notice, you know what? Hey, I sin without struggle. I commit fornication without struggle. I lie without struggle. I uh, cheat without struggle. I cuss without struggle. And, and you can do all of those things. You, you, com you, you commit adultery, all that kind of stuff. You're, you know, you, you're living in these relationships and you're not, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you. I mean, sin is just natural to you. And you can do it and have no problem. There is no struggle in your spirit. This is just okay, my brother and sister. That would suggest strongly that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is not resident in you. The oil is not in your vessel. Because if the oil is in your vessel, if the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you, you are not perfect in your behavior, but you cannot and you will not continue to have peace with sin, you will resist it. You may not always be successful, but you will resist it. Again, examine yourself. Is there the inward assurance that as a result of the inward experience is the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit that you're a child of God? And then what about your outward expressions? Uh, is the bent of your life towards righteousness, towards holiness, towards the things that please God? If you can say yes and yes, then you can be absolutely certain right now that if Christ was to come today, you're going straight to be with him. You're ready to meet the Lord. But if you cannot say yes concerning the inward assurance or the inward experience, or, and you cannot say yes concerning the bent of your life towards holiness, towards righteousness, and against sin, then that's reason to, a, to, to pause and perhaps what you need to do and do it from your heart is right now to acknowledge your sins and repent of them. And I, when I say repent, I don't, I'm not just saying ask him to forgive you. I'm talking about the decision to turn from them. That's what repentance is. It's not asking God to forgive you. The provision for forgiveness is already there. God has already offered forgiveness, so you don't even have to worry about that. But what you do need to decide is, I'm making the decision based upon what I know concerning God and concerning Jesus. I'm repenting. I am I'm making the decision to turn from sin towards God. And then surrender your life by faith to Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do it now because Jesus said the hour, the time, we don't know, but when we least expect, he will show up. Now, there's another group, though. There is the wise. And I want to talk to those of us who say, yes, I've examined myself. I have no doubt. I have the assurance in my heart, inwardly, and I see the outward expressions that, that confirm that this life of Christ is really mine because there's a bent in my life towards righteousness and holiness and against sin. I see it, the, the, the fruit of repentance is working in my life. Faith is alive in me. I'm not perfect, but that's definitely the bent in the direction of my life. I know I'm saved, but praise God. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Rejoice in that. Your salvation has been affected, effected by Christ. And the Bible says, he who has begun this good work in you, he's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I firmly believe that that which God has begun in your life, he's going to continue it and continue it, and he will perform it up until the day of Jesus Christ. It's hallelujah. But hear me. I am concerned, though, that those of us who have received Christ and we have this assurance of our salvation and we know that we're ready, that many of us yet have become too complacent in our salvation. We are too comfortable in Zion, so to speak. We have become passive when it comes to the things of God. The scripture tells us 
And, and Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe it's verse 10. He says, now be diligent. Be diligent to show yourself. No, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. That's what he said. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. And then he says, you know what? Before that, beginning at 1 Peter chapter, 2, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3, he talks about how God has given us the precious promises. We have these wonderful promises that God has given us. So we have the promises of God. We have the presence of Christ. We have the promise of the Spirit. We have pardon for all our sins. He said, having received all of this by God's grace, we possess all of these things. He said, now, add to your faith virtue. Add to virtue knowledge. And he says, add kindness and add perseverance. He says, if you do these things, you will not be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus. What does this mean? It means that God doesn't want you just going to heaven. He wants you to occupy until he comes. He wants you and me who are saved, who are forgiven, who know that we're ready not to just be passive. He wants us to pursue godliness with all our hearts. And he wants us to desire to be fruitful. Bear much fruit. While we're waiting for the Lord's return, he wants us not to be barren. He wants us to be fruitful. And so he says, just sitting down and being complacent, I know I'm saved and, and okay, I know I believe and I know I'm not living in sin. It's not about not living in sin for you and me. It's about now pursuing godliness, pursuing spiritual growth with all our hearts. It's about intensifying our commitment to be fruitful, to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, growing in grace, growing in faith, pursuing and making the things that will make us fruitful in this life the priorities of our life. As a believer, child of God, have you based upon the revelation of all that Christ has done for you and who you now are in him and what you now have because you have the precious Holy Spirit, which is the very power of God on the inside of you. You can't afford to just be complacent. The Spirit of God is there not just to prepare you for heaven, but the Spirit of God is inside of you now to make you footful, no longer barren, but footful and productive and effective here on earth as you represent Christ and you manifest his nature through you. Too many of us are complacent. And so I want to end by charging you who do not know Christ and who are not ready to get ready for his coming. And those of us who haven't examined ourselves, say, I know I'm saved. I'm saying to you, hear me. Be more than ever committed to being fruitful, being productive, Pursue spiritual growth. Pursue fruitfulness so that you are not buried. And in, in that way, when Christ comes, he will find you doing the things that please him the most. In Jesus' name. Amen. How to be ready for the second coming? If you're not born again, get born again now. If you are born again, get busy pursuing spiritual growth. Make it a priority to not be barren, but to be fruitful while you await the coming of your Lord and Master. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask all of you who are watching to join me in this prayer. It's going to be for both groups, those who are not ready and for those who are ready. But let these words come out of your heart and let them be spoken sincerely and with faith because that's the kind of prayer the Lord responds to. Say, Father God, I thank you for Jesus who has paid the price for the sins of the whole world. And Father, I do repent of sin. I confess sin is evil. I confess I have sinned. I confess I cannot save myself. 
So I repent. I turn. I change my mind concerning sin. Jesus, I do surrender. And I will continue to surrender. And I will continue to express my faith in you as my Lord and Savior. But it is only you who can save my soul. Jesus, you are my Savior and you are my Lord. Thank you. And now, Lord, that you have come into me and the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, I know, Lord, that you do not want me to be barren. I don't want to be barren. I want to be fruitful while I wait for your return. So by the grace you give me and by the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, trusting you, I pursue knowledge of you. And I add to that knowledge virtue. And I add to that virtue, patience and loving kindness. Lord, I am making spiritual growth my priority. And I'm depending upon the Holy Spirit who lives in me to enable this to be my priority. From this day forward, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Now take this word and put it into practice. And remember, you can listen to this again and again because it's available online. Listen to it again. But most importantly, act upon it because Jesus Christ is returning. And when he returns, you can be ready for his appearance. In Jesus' name, amen.
right now where you are, even as you have confessed the Lord is your strength, strength like no other. I release my faith and I set myself in agreement with you that the Lord is your strength and therefore you will not lack for strength. Whatever it is that you are confronting, whether it is a temptation or a test that the enemy has brought against you or your family, because the Lord is your strength, I declare that that temptation will be no match for you and that test will be no match for you. But the Lord who is your strength will cause you to overcome and to be victorious no matter what it is or how it appears. I declare the word of the Lord unto you. You are of God. You have overcome them, whatever them is, you have overcome, not because you're strong in yourself, but because the Lord is your strength and the Lord dwells in you. For greater is he, yeah, greater is he, that Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that lives in you is greater than anything and anyone in the world that is against you. In this, your strength, in this, your victory, Go forth down, child of God, and conquer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please remember to share this video, this worship experience, this word with your friends and your family. Let's get the gospel out to the nations. People need to hear that Christ is coming and they must be born again and that the Holy Ghost must dwell in them. Let this message go out to tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands who need it in Jesus' name. Share it. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and the Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Chris and I love you and we miss you and looking forward to being together again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. You are my strength, strength like no other, strength like no other. Reach Straight like no